Welcome back everyone, and we're just going to continue on with the next chapter of The Time Twister by Jenny Nimmo. Olivia Makes a Mess Billy Raven lay wide awake. For two weeks he had slept alone in the long dormitory. Now he must get used to the grunts and snores, the heavy breathing, and the tiny whimpers of other boys. It wasn't easy. Billy had always been a light sleeper. Tonight, he was feeling excited. He had something to tell old Ezekiel Blore. Perhaps he would be rewarded. When he was quite sure the other boys were asleep, Billy swung his feet into his slippers and pulled on his dressing gown. The floorboards gave only the slightest creak as he crossed the room and slipped out of the dormitory. Manford Blore had given Billy a present for Christmas. A long black torch with a very powerful beam. Billy hadn't expected a gift from the head boy of all people, but when Manfred bent down and whispered, We must keep our spies happy, Billy had understood. He switched on the torch and a brilliant shaft of light swooped right to the end of the passage. Billy began his long journey to the upper regions of the West Wing. He usually waited for Blessed to lead him, but tonight... He couldn't wait. As Billy made his way closer to old man, the old man's room, he had to navigate a gloomy realm that never changed. It was one of the few places where Ezekiel's flawed magic had worked as he wished. So Billy's slippered feet made no print in the thick dust, and the cobwebs he'd walked through wove themselves together as soon as he passed. But... If it were not for the occasional hiss from a gaslight, you would have thought the creaking steps and the shadowy passages had been deserted for a hundred years. Billy had reached a black door, the paint scarred by years of dog scratches. He knocked twice, and a voice croaked, Who's there? Billy Raven, said Billy. Enter, Billy Raven, said the voice. Billy walked in. Ezekiel Bloor sat in his wheelchair beside a blazing fire. A sheepskin rug was draped around his shoulders, and his ancient skull-like face poked from beneath a black woolly hat. A pile of faded velvet cushions were propped behind his back, and he wore a black velvet jacket studded with gold buttons. For all his finery, though, Billy couldn't help thinking the old man looked a bit like a dead sheep. Without being invited, the small boy sat down heavily in the chair opposite Ezekiel. A sudden change in the atmosphere made him feel dizzy. Where's the dog? asked the old man. I don't know. I couldn't wait for him. I wanted to tell you something. Billy's glasses became misted up in the steamy atmosphere. He took them off and rubbed the lenses with his thumbs. Ah, good. Something about Charlie? The old man leaned forward eagerly. Sort of, said Billy. Come on, then. Tell. Tell. Well, it was blessed, really. He saw it. It, wheezed the old man, it, what it was this? And the dog's name is Percy. How many times do I have to tell you? Sorry, but he thinks he's blessed. Yes, yes, never mind. Go on. Ezekiel waved his hand impatiently. Billy put his glasses back on, and then he wished he hadn't. The old man's wizened face loomed unpleasantly close. Billy could see every wart and bristle in vivid detail. The dog was howling, and Manfred sent me to sort him out, knowing I could understand dog talk and all that. I wish I could understand that wretched dog. Ezekiel shook his head. So, what did he say? He said he'd seen a boy come out of nowhere, and this boy had a ball, 
very small and shiny. He said it was bat. What? The old man clapped a hand over his mouth. What? A boy? And, and was it glass this ball? Could be, said Billy, amazed by the excitement his news had caused. No, no, it can't be. Ezekiel stood up, but his useless legs wouldn't let him down, and he sank back into his cocoon of sheep's wool and velvet. And then I noticed Charlie Bone in the hall, and Blessed said he looked like the appearing boy. Billy smiled and waited for the effect of these words. He wasn't disappointed. Charlie Bone, breathed Ezekiel. Yes, yes, of course. He was a bit like Charlie Bone. No wonder I can't stand the boy. Find him, Billy. Bring him here. Who? Charlie? No, you fool. The other. My cousin, Henry. Your cousin? said Billy, confused. How? I don't know where he is. You just told me he's in the building. It can't be that difficult. You mean he's your... My cousin, yes. I sent him backing two years ago. Many, many years ago. Never thought I'd see that wretch again. The old man's voice dropped to a low rumble. Must be the weather. Coordinating temperatures. Hmm. Time twister works that way. Hmm. He drummed his fingers on the arm of his wheelchair. Billy was intrigued. What's a time twister? Ezekiel looked up. His small black eyes seemed to be staring right through Billy. It's a marvelous thing, he murmured. A crystal ball, hardly bigger than a marble. It can twist you through the years. No wonder the dog didn't like it. Never look at it unless you want to travel. That's what my auntie told me. Ask the dog where the boy is. Percy knows everything. Now get out and close the door. Billy was very disappointed. He'd expected to be rewarded rewarded with a cup of cocoa at the very least. Er, you know what she said about my parents? He began. Parents, you haven't got any, said Ezekiel. Clearly his mind was on other things. N no, but you said someone wanted to adopt me, Billy said hopefully. Did I... Can't remember. We'll see about them when you found the boy. And don't forget the twister. Ezekiel dismissed Billy with a wave of his bony hand. Billy slipped out of his chair and made for the door. Then he turned to the old man and said, Thanks for the boots. My chili blains are much better. Ezekiel grunted. He wasn't listening to the boy. When Billy had gone, the old man stared into the flames, uttered a stream of strange words and sounds, and now and again the name Henry bubbled to the surface, and then Time Twister. Other recognizable words were Never, How, No, No, Why. Impossible. These were spat so hard into the flames they began to sizzle. The fire might have gone out altogether if the old man hadn't reached into a silver box beside him and tossed a handful of sparkling sticks into the grate. But these small magic sticks caused a violent explosion, 
Clouds of black smoke billowed out into the room, and the old man was overcome by a violent fit of coughing. <coughs> Idiots, he croaked at the innocent silver box. Charlie was awake, but he couldn't think why. Something must have awoken him. What was it? The distant chimes of the cathedral clock began to ring out across the city. It was midnight, and the back of Charlie's neck began to tingle. He felt as he always did when he heard the clock strike twelve. Afraid and elated at the same time. A bed creaked at the end of the room, and he wondered if Billy had been out and about. Even if he had, he wouldn't be punished for it. Last term, Billy had won the ruin game, and he was now the proud possessor of a bronze medal. A medal that would give him extra privileges and a whole year free of detention. Billy, is that you? Charlie whispered. No answer, but there was a long creak, and Charlie was sure it came from Billy's bed. Where have you been? he asked. None of your business, came the reply. It was definitely Billy's voice. Charlie burrowed under the covers. If Billy wanted to be secretive, let him, Charlie thought. He had other things to worry about. Rescuing Henry, for one thing, the whole enterprise needed needed very careful planning. First of all, he would have to get some food to Henry. Before he could decide how to do this, Charlie had fallen asleep. Fidelio's dreams had been... Oh, sorry. Fidelio's dreams had been more productive. He had devised a way for Charlie to nip up to the music tower after lunch. But they would need help. Over breakfast the next morning, Fidelio outlined, outlined his plan to Charlie. Olivia will do it, he murmured in Charlie's ear. Although there was a great deal of noise all around them, Fidelio didn't want their plans to be overheard. Olivia? How can she help? Charlie said softly. He tried to keep his lips as rigid as possible because Billy Raven, sitting opposite, was watching them intently. Fidelia was also aware of Billy's intense stare. He turned his head away from the table and whispered harshly, She can create a diversion. We need someone to stop Manfred and Asa Pike from reaching the hall when you go through the door to the tower. We both use the drama canteen. If Olivia can hold those two up for a few minutes, you stand a chance. No one else would bother to watch us. What are you whispering about? Charlie and Fidelio looked up to see Manfred leaning over Billy's chair. He was studying them closely. It was almost as if the younger boy had called him over. Well, come on. Share your secret, Charlie Bone. Manfred's black eyes glittered dangerously. Charlie immediately lowered his head. He knew he could fight Manfred's hypnotizing stare, but... He didn't want to get in trouble with the head boy before Henry had been rescued. Fidelio said quickly, We were discussing Olivia Vertigo's hair. Oh. Manfred raised a thin, black eyebrow. Yes, we thought blue looked very nice on her, said Charlie. But we didn't like to say it out loud in case, you know, she hurt us. As if, said Manfred scathingly. It's not exactly quiet in here, is it? Personally, I think Olivia Vertigo's hair looks ghastly. He shouted this last remark, and hearing her name mentioned, Olivia looked over to the table from behind her. When she saw Charlie's serious face, she grimaced and turned her attack on the lumpy porridge. Manfred drifted away and began to shout at a small girl who was wearing her cape inside out. Whew, muttered Charlie. Let's talk at break. Good idea, agreed Fidelio. By the time the two boys had managed to call Olivia away from her friends, break was almost over. 
Olivia came bouncing across the snowy ground in bright pink lace-ups, studded with sequins. The snow's taking all the paint off, she complained, holding out her left foot. The toe of her boot was a nasty gray color. Olivia, we need a favor, said Charlie, coming straight to the point. Oh, Olivia had put her foot back in the snow. What sort of a favor? Charlie knew it was no good trying to get Olivia to do something without a proper explanation. She'd have to know all about Henry before she agreed to help, so as quickly as he could, Charlie told her everything. Olivia's mouth dropped open, and her large gray eyes grew even wider. Do you mean that he got himself sort of whizzed out of the past here and now? Yes. Charlie looked over his shoulders. He thought he saw Billy Raven hovering behind a group of music students. But we want to keep it a secret until we know how to help him. I've got to give him some food. And we thought Charlie could sneak my sausages up to the tower at lunch break, said Fidelio. If you could keep Manfred and Asa in your canteen for a few extra minutes. <laughs> no problem, said Olivia. Leave it to me. A long blast from the hunting horn sent the children racing in from the field, and Olivia ran off to join her friends. We'll just have to trust her, said Charlie. She's usually reliable. Each department had its own canteen, and a drama canteen was always the noisiest and the most undisciplined. Manfred had done his best to stop them wearing fancy shoes and long skirts, but the drama teachers were very lax with the rules. They seldom complained about their pupils' choices of clothing. In fact, they rather encouraged hats with ears, unusual footwear, and colored face paint. Miss Marlowe had, Mrs. Marlowe, head of drama, considered clothes a means of self-expression, the more unusual, the better. All this infuriated Manfred, but there was little he could do about it, so he took it out on the children in music and art. Today, the drama canteen was a mess. Someone's waistcoat was molting, and white fur lay all over the floor. Someone else's hat was shedding feathers, and these had floated into the gravy pan. Glitter had stuck to some of the chairs, and the tables were littered with paint flakes, tinsel, and bits of false hair. It's disgusting, grumbled Manfred, staring at a sequin in his custard. Why can't people be more conventional? For himself, he favored plain black with occasionally a purple shirt to match his cape. Even the ribbon in his ponytail was black. Asa Pike gave a nervous snigger. The mustache he found he was fond of wearing had dropped on his plate. Oops, he said. Forgot I was wearing it. Manfred shot his companion a look of contempt. There were times, Asa... When I would enjoy giving you a good kick. Asa's yellow eyes took on a nasty gleam. Manfred began to regret his words. He and Asa were not true friends. They stuck together because everyone else disliked them. Asa might fawn on Manfred, but Manfred knew quite well that Asa could be as dangerous as he was. Manfred could hypnotize, but when night fell, Asa could become something wild and deadly, a creature beyond Manfred's power. So the boys sat at their table with tight lips, brooding eyes, until, sun, until a sudden commotion by their door broke their disagreeable silence. Huh, it's Olivia Vertigo again, said Asa, looking towards the disturbance. Manfred stood up. Not her! He strode over to the door. Olivia had managed to tip the entire contents of a tray right in front of the door. Most of the glass and crockery had broken and now lay in jagged pieces, cakes with gravy and custard. Sorry, 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 said Olivia. I slipped. Sorry's not good enough, said Manfred. Go and get a cloth. Yes, Manfred. Olivia walked briskly across the canteen and into the kitchen. 
I'll give them five minutes, she muttered, looking at her watch. No one paid any attention to Olivia until Cook came through a door at the back of the kitchen. She marched up to Olivia and said, You're on the wrong side of the door, dear. I came for a piece of bread, lied Olivia. Didn't you have enough to eat? asked Cook. I was late, said Olivia, glancing at her watch. Come on, I'll see what I can do. Cook was about to turn away when the door behind Olivia was suddenly flung open. Manfred stood glaring at Olivia. Where's the cloth, you idiot? We can't get out unless that mess is cleared. I, er, Olivia began. Hold your horses, Manfred Blore, said Cook sharply. Everything comes to those who wait. Huh? grunted Manfred. Cook ambled across the kitchen and took a cloth, a bucket, and a pair of rubber, glo rubber gloves from under the sink. Manfred shouted. For God's sakes, hurry up, woman. Cook froze. She dropped the bucket and stared at Manfred with her hands on her hips. Don't you speak to me like that. Don't you dare. Don't you ever use that tone with me again. E yeah, e yeah, said Manfred nervously. Apologize, said Cook. S sorry, mumbled Manfred, pretending to examine his fingernails. Olivia could hardly believe it. In a few words, Cook had reduced the head boy to a jittering junior. Cook picked up the bucket and handed it to Manfred. If you want a mess cleared up, do it yourself. But I didn't make the mess, cried Manfred, turning scarlet. Cook shrugged and walked away. Manfred gave Olivia a vicious shove through the door, and as soon as they were on the other side, handed her the bucket. At that very moment, Charlie and Fidelio were crossing the hall. Now that the children from drama were all trapped in their canteen, there were fewer people about, and Charlie managed to nip through the door into the west wing without being seen. Fidelio stood guard. When Charlie had completed his mission, he would give two taps on the door, and as the coast was clear, Fidelio would tap back. Charlie raced up the deep spiraling, spiraling steps that led to the tower, top of the tower. By the time he reached the music room, he was out of breath and had a stitch in his side. Henry had gone. A large blue cape lay over the back of a chair, and there was an empty tin on a stool. Some of the books were covered in crumbs, and two sheet papers had been dropped by the window. Mr. Pilgrim was playing very softly today. He kept repeating the same notes over and over as if he couldn't remember where the music was going. Without knocking, Charlie opened the door and looked in. Mr. Pilgrim was alone. He wasn't wearing his cape, and Charlie remembered that he'd been without it at assembly, but then Mr. Pilgrim often forgot things. The music teacher looked over the piano and frowned at Charlie. Excuse me, sir, said Charlie. Have you seen a boy? A boy a bit like me? Very much to his surprise, Mr. Pilgrim answered quite clearly. Yeah, there was a boy. And do you know where he is now, sir? He shouldn't have been up here alone, said Mr. Pilgrim. Not at night. It's too cold. Yes, but where did he go? He was hungry. Mr. Pilgrim must have suddenly recalled the notes he'd been searching for because he played two loud chords and then launched himself into a very complicated piece of music. Charlie realized that it would be useless to ask the teacher any more questions. Besides, if he didn't get back soon, Manfred and Asa would be prowling around the hall. Thank you, sir. Charlie left the room and, closing the door behind him, ran all the way down to the bottom of the tower. He descended the winding stairs so quickly by the time he reached the ground floor, 
He felt very wobbly on his feet. Before he went to the dark passage that led to the hall, he stopped to listen. He could hear nothing. It was safe to enter the passage. All the same, he tiptoed over the stone floor. He had only gone a few meters when he walked straight into something. A small, thin figure that was hardly a person at all. It whimpered slightly and scuttled away. But when Charlie turned to look back, the person or thing turned back too. Its eyes glittered behind a thin black veil, and it whispered, Boy! Then it was gone. And that is the end of this chapter. <sighs> Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the chapter like I did. Please let me know your thoughts. What are you thinking? What's going on? Um, and of course, like, subscribe, comment as always. I really enjoy the comments. And share. Share with your friends and family. And of course, hit that notification bell and you'll definitely no be notified as soon as I drop another chapter of another book. Until next time, I'll catch you later. <laughs>